Hour podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRate.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany, as well as the founder of Startup.Radio, the world's first internet radio station dedicated to tech, startups, and tech entrepreneurship topics. Today, I do have a repeating guest, so to say, Philip here with me. Hey, Philip, how you doing? Fine. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I'm very curious which questions you have prepared for me. <laughs> yes, you should be. We should tell our audience a little bit about you. You have been a guest as a subject matter expert before on digital um, assets, on digital securities, which already came into law here in Germany. But you're also a professor at Frankfurt School of Management and Finance. You're the head of the Blockchain Center. And you are, of course, as a as a professor and a PhD and author as well. Uh, our audience may know the publication called Forbes, for which you are a contributor. Plus, you're also an advisor at Fint. Tech Rat, which is the FinTech Council and Advisory Board to the German Federal Government. And according to FAZ newspaper, one of Germany's largest newspaper, you are one of the 30 most influential economists in the German speaking area. And I have to tell my audience, you are the very first guest I ever have who has his own Wikipedia article. I'm so honored to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Joe. That, that's very nice. But you know, this Wikipedia thing, uh, article, you know, I didn't do this. You know, somebody, I don't know who, but somebody copy pasted my CV and uh, now it's there. I, I try to change and amend it a little bit, uh, but other people then have unloaded, right? So it's not, it's not, it's very strange what happens on Wikipedia, but it's, it's a nice anecdote to be there. And uh, yeah, thanks for these nice words. Um, indeed, uh, working at the Frankfurt School, you know, which is a nice, small, agile university is fun uh, because we also are able to educate digital stuff, you know, real digital stuff towards our students, for example, talking about blockchain, uh, art, um, data science, and so on. In Germany, there are not many universities at this point of time who are educating blockchain stuff uh, to their students, even though it's getting more and more important. And uh, I'm also getting more and more job offers uh, from consulting companies and others who ask me to forward their job offers to students. You know, it's really, really increasing. I get three to four per week, you know, that's massive. Um, and, uh, but you know, these people are not being educated yet. So therefore I'm happy to, to work at the university, which is uh, really trying to deliver digital stuff uh, to young people yeah? and young people should, should learn things which they need in the future. Otherwise they will be unemployed. Right. So I think, I think it's, it's a good, it's a good university to work there. Us, you're also a very good salesman. Everybody who'd like to get into the program uh, that you forward the job offers to, they can go down here in the show notes. We'll have a link to the Frankfurt School of Management and Finance. Today, we are talking about Central Bank Digital Currency, CBDC to make it pretty easy, uh, especially the digital year, since we are in the city of the year in Frankfurt. Um, first, I was wondering, what is actually different here? If I now open my banking app, I already have digital currency there. What is the big difference between now and let's say when we have a digital euro? Yeah, so that's a very, very good question because nobody knows. And you know why? <laughs> because the ECB is at this point of time still in the process of doing like the concept how a digital euro in Europe could look like. Yeah, Like the, the European Central Bank, the ECB, is currently exploring what's uh, basically potentially the best solution for a digital euro. So therefore, we have some assumption what's going on in, in the ECB, but it's not absolutely sure how the ECB will design the digital euro. And if I may add some words here, I think the, the CBDC topic is, is a very complex topic. It, it also feels a little bit um, yeah, difficult to explain. And therefore, I like it better to frame it as the discussion around the digital euro, the digital dollar, and the digital yuan coming from China, right? And And why is this? Because, you know, the CBDC topic, as you have framed it, is a specific design variant 
how a euro might run on a modern infrastructure, right? Is it because what you're suggesting in terms of talking about a CBDC means that you're suggesting that the central bank is operating the system and delivering the money, right? But actually, this is just half of the truth, because in case we are today spending our money, which is sitting on a PayPal account, which is sitting on a credit card, which is sitting on a normal bank account and so on, then it, this is not central bank money, right? This is called commercial bank money, which means that this money is being supplied to you, to me, to all of the listeners out there by a normal bank, right? The bank is delivering the money. It's just the central bank on the back end, right? Um, it's basically a multi-tiered system. On the very back end, you have the central bank. In the middle, you have the commercial bank, could be Wells Fargo, could be Deutsche Bank or whoever. And then uh, we as customers are connected to the commercial bank, not to the central bank. And therefore, if we talk about CBDCs, then this automatically suggests that we are potentially something like customers to the European Central Bank. And this, in my mind, is the wrong framing, because in the future, we will still have commercial banks, such as, as I said, you know, Deutsche Bank, Wells Fargo, and so on. But the infrastructure will be different. And therefore, I would always prefer uh, to call this discussion the digital euro, the digital dollar, the digital yuan, and so on, and not, not just call it CBDC, because this is just half of the truth. And speaking for Europe, it's the worse half of the truth, so to say, uh, because the ECB is doing basically a good job. Yes, it, it starts to explore um, the digital euro, but we also have to see here that, for example, China is years ahead and the ECB is uh, basically working in a quite slow mode. And this then leads to the situation that, for example, in China, we will have their launch of the digital yuan, that's the Chinese currency, we will see their launch this year. And the ECB might launch their solution in 2026. Yeah, that's basically five years from now. That's the time when, EC, when the ECB might launch their digital euro solution. Whereas in China, their solution will then be already live for five years, right? So it's five years of time differential here. And therefore, um, to be honest, I think the, the ECB is, the, is doing an okay job working on this. But in my mind, they should really speed up this entire topic because China will be live this year. And if you wish, uh, we can also directly talk about the situation in the U.S. Yes, that would be great. Um, I, I actually also had China a little bit down my uh, preparations. Uh, there is actually a central bank digital currency tracker that I'll, that I'll uh, link down here in the show notes. I think there are 20 to 50 central banks currently working on digital central bank digital currency. And you referred to China last data I found. They already processed more than 4 million transactions in CBDC or digital yuan, um, worth more than 200 million US dollars. So they're quite ahead of the ECB doing some research. Um, Yes, let us talk a little bit about the US and then we may go back and go a little bit uh, um, from the app back to the central bank and how this may change. Yeah, makes sense. So, you know, as I said, the, the uh, China is basically live. And as you have said, you know, the numbers are also the numbers I know. They have done their experiments with on the digital Juan with 140 million people. You know, that's what they call experiments in terms of prototypes, right? Uh, in Germany, we have 82 million inhabitants. So twice the size approximately is basically the size of a prototype in China. You know, imagine this. And this is absolutely fascinating because China is basically way ahead. And we can also criticize China. You know, the system is intransparent. We do not know much about the technology and uh, who knows uh, whether the data will be used for analyzing uh, um, people there. And who knows? Right. But still, we have to see here, China is doing an amazing role here in terms of geopolitics, in terms of digitally transforming their currency and equipping their 
currency with uh, digital functions. Let's talk about this later. Then in Europe, we have the ECB, which is basically, as I said, a little bit slower, six years of time differential. And the situation in the US is, is basically quite similar to the ECB and to Europe here, because the, the Fed in the US is also ex is basically doing some very, very early experiments. They are doing a lot of writing of reports, a lot of authoring. They are analyzing this. So the ECB and the Fed is basically in a, in a quite joint stage uh, here, right? So, and therefore, of course, China is also ahead of the US. But there is a huge difference here. Uh, for the US dollar, we already have a solution. And the solution is called US dollar stable coins. We have coming from the crypto world, a couple of stable coins where you have blockchain infrastructure such as Ethereum and some others. And there people have issued the US dollar in terms of stable uh, as a stable coin, right? It's something like a token running on a blockchain system and it's referenced to the US dollar price. That's basically 1.00. And this way you have a blockchain US dollar already running and the daily volume of the US dollar stable coins are partly exceeding 100 billion per day. If you sum this up on a monthly level, this is trillions per month. You know, this is massive, but People in the U.S. are skeptical towards uh, these U.S. dollar stable coins because some of them have not been regulated perfectly. Um, the, 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 these companies are called Tether, USDC coming from Circle or Paxos and so on. And especially Tether has been a critical uh, company in the past, which has also been sued uh, by a couple of U.S states, I think so, because uh, the, apparently the question was always in case T Tessa is saying we are having five billions of US dollars as tokens, then the question is, do they really have five billions of US dollar on their bank account, right? Is it really fully backed? That was the question with regard to Tether. Therefore, uh, the regulation was improved a little bit, but people in the US and also in Europe are still very skeptical about the, the US dollar stable coins. But, you know, in case you simply talk about the numbers, the US dollar is having a digital solution. There is a digital dollar already out there, but it's not coming from the Fed at this point of time, not coming from the central bank, but rather it operates as a stable coin. And in case you are now improving the regulatory situation around US dollar stable coins, then you could argue that the US dollar has become digital coming from the crazy crypto world and at some point of time then spilling over uh, to, to more legacy uh, industries and so on. So to summarize here in terms of geopolitics, and I think this is very, very exciting, we have China with a government-initiated solution coming from the central bank. We have both the Fed and the European Central Bank be a little bit or significantly uh, slower here. And this opens up a gap between China and the U.S., and this gap could potentially be filled by the US dollar stable coins such as USDC coming from Cir Circle and some others one. And even PayPal have, has now announced that they might investigate such US dollar stable coins. So this gap between US dollar and China might be filled by the US dollar stable coins in case the uh, regulatory improvements are happening. But, and this is the key point I would like to make, the gap between the euro and the Chinese currency is still there because there are no, that's basically close to zero euro stable coins. Yeah. So the US gap can be filled, but the gap for Europe towards China cannot be filled because we do not have euro stable coins out there. This would be my expectation of what's going on this year in the world of uh, digital currencies, digital euro, digital dollar and so on. My feet are actually tingling when you say, oh, there's close to zero euro stable coins. That would mean there is a big market opportunity there as well. And when we've been talking about um, the digital US dollar is basically filled by private companies um, and there is some regulation to stabilize that, I had in mind a few Fed, uh, very seasoned Fed bankers who were close to a stroke when they realized, oh, that's US dollar. That's money, and we don't control it. <laughs> um, we, we yeah. It, go ahead. It's a very, very good point, uh, Joe. But, uh, but the interesting point is here. You know, in case you're having a bank issuing the money, I'm having then on my smartphone. It is exactly the same like PayPal issuing the US dollar for 
my app on the smartphone, you know, the PayPal app, right? And, you know, going one step further, what is exactly the difference between a stable coin issuer in case it's regulated appropriately, then it's simply something like PayPal, but running on blockchain, right? The regulation is there. It's not affecting money supply because such stable coins are basically issued as tokens running on blockchain systems. But on the back end, they are fully backed by the US dollar because this is regulatory um, requirements which have to be fulfilled, right? So think of a US dollar stable coins as something like PayPal, but only at this point of time when they are regulated in exactly the same way, right? Then this becomes very clear. And uh, concerning your first point where you would expect like huge uh, market opportunities in Europe, Actually, Joe, I thought exactly the same, but the situation here is a little bit different. And you know why? Because we have negative interest rates. This means in case you have an euro stable coin where the price is 1.00 per token, 1.00 euro per token, that's the price. Then this token is created such that it's not interest bearing. But on the back end, you have the issuer who has to store euro on its bank account and this bank account is basically um, yeah, exposed to negative interest rates, which have to be paid to the ECB. So, so, so that means case, that you, you, you issue digital euro, you have the real euro on your bank account, and actually the bank is slowly chipping away on those euros. You're actually incurring a loss just with that, just for the simple reason that we have negative interest rates, right? Yes, exactly, right? So therefore, you know, it's it's a very bad combination having the, 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 the regulatory requirements for stable coins combined with negative interest rates. You know, it's it's just an it's an artifact, right? You know, nobody wanted to have it like this way, but this is now now how it came. And given this situation, uh, it just doesn't make sense for a stable coin issuer to issue a large scale euro stable coin because this project will be profit unprofitable as of day one, right? We do have some euro stable coin. I have to mention Celo and a couple of others, you know, they are really doing an amazing job, but they also say that it's difficult for them to operate because they are operating by definition at a loss, you know, and a company which needs to operate at a loss and in case, you know, so imagine this company is growing, it gets successful, then the loss is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, this, this cannot be sustainable, right? So therefore, this is one reason why there are no large scale euro stable coins, but there are also other reasons why, uh, why the, why the stable coins are uh, primarily US dollar referenced. And actually the US dollar market shares of the, of the stable coins is basically 99%, you know, there is basically no other currency in the stablecoin domain at this point of time except the US dollar. And the reason for this is rooted in how in the, in the way crypto markets are existing. For example, decentralized finance is basically, um, a smart contract based financial market for the future. And DeFi would not work without the US dollar because everybody who is doing the stuff in DeFi, at least to some degree, is computing his wealth in US dollar, right? So DeFi, the crypto ecosystem is basically an international market. And to some degree, people also compute in Bitcoin there or in, in Ether. But many, many people are also computing their wealth in this kind of international, transnational market in US dollar. And this then has led to the 100% or 99% US dollarization of this uh, crypto domain, right? This is very, very interesting. And this is basically the second uh, reason why we have large scale US dollar stable coins, but uh, we do not have any other stable coins at this point of time. Mm -hmm. We may add uh, what we're talking about here um, about the central bank role. We, we won't get into like all the details, monetary operation, money supply, and so on and so forth. But basically, um, the central banks, like talking about all the central banks in the world here, they have to regulate money supply in order either to keep the interest, uh, to keep the inflation low or to generate jobs or in, in, uh, in the case of the Fed, both or in the case of the euro, which is officially just, um, targeting an inflation rate on the euro, but actually they're also acting as if job supply, job generation 
would be one of the targets. Um, and there is a lot of science. There is a lot of research around this. And I do believe with everything I just touched here, you could fill whole libraries out there. So we won't get into that. But basically, one of the main things the central banks are doing is regulating the money supply, M1, M2, M3. And um, basically, they do it differently in Europe, with the repo business, they do it differently in the US with the Fed trading desk in New York. I'll link a hell lot of articles down here, but don't ask me for all the details because we don't have years of time here. <laughs> um, but basically where I was going at is that the central banks are actually having a very important role that we had to learn over time, especially during time of hyperinflation, especially uh, regarding the 1920s, 1930s here in Germany, um, the bank collapses in the 1930s, land of last resort, and so on and so forth. So they are fulfilling a very important function right now. And so I do believe that also has to be translated into digital currencies because when I thought about it, mm, you have tokenized this. So basically, what is the difference now? I could have an app and I have the central bank. And basically, the central bank, theoretically speaking, could just deal with all the retail customers directly via app in terms of a real digital euro. Uh, don't get me wrong. I don't think this will necessarily ever happen, but it's a theoretical model. But then you would need to change all we just touched, like bank regulation, money supply, economic growth, job generation, all those duties would have to, to be regulated completely differently, which is very interesting topic, but also nothing we go into right now. But let us first try to touch a little bit how everything looks different right now. My understanding is that there's somebody um, in front of SAP working at the European Central Bank and they're shuffle shuffling around billions and billions and billions and billions between the accounts of the banks at the central bank because all the banks regulated in the euro area have to have an account at the European Central Bank. And that's basically how transfers between them usually works. And then you have the retail client who's actually working with the bank, right? That is how it works right now. So what will be changing with the digital euro? Yeah, exactly. So the question is, you know, why do we talk about the digital uh, euro exactly? So, and there are many, many, many reasons. So let me mention two, three reasons why it does make sense. So imagine you have a US dollar stable coin, you have the digital US dollar, the digital euro or whatever. And I would like to transfer money from here in Germany to you in South Korea. Yeah. Then, you know, you international, say, oh. money, <laughs> international money transfers are very, very complex. You know, names are not really matching perfectly. Then addresses of banks have to be transferred. Oh, oh, you have, oh. uh, May I chip in here? Just for example, my name. I'm not officially Joe. I'm Jörn. That is J O with the two dots in it, R N. But many computer systems outside of the German speaking area cannot even do this letter U. So basically there's there's already a problem here and it doesn't get any better if you go further and further out in the world. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, imagine you're called uh, Mohammed, for example, you know, there, I think there are 40 variants of how Mohammed is being spelled, you know, with one M, with double M, with U, with A, with O and so on, you know, and these IT systems, they are just not matching all this stuff uh, properly. So you have manual work involved in case you are doing cross-border transactions. And this then involves uh, manual work, computer work, uh, money can go lost and so on. And uh, you then end up with, uh, with long cycle times of transactions and high transaction costs. Even from me in Germany, sending money to Switzerland costs me 25 euro, you know, and this is a neighbor country uh, with basically the same language, 25 euro for one money transfer. So imagine be money being sent to Thailand or to South Korea and so on. And therefore, and this is very important, Joe, in case we are talking about the European citizen, you know, somebody living in a German small town, going to work every day, having a car and so on, and and don't having to do international money trans, uh, transferrals and so on, those people will not benefit from, from the digital euro. For them, the current infrastructure is absolutely perfect. But in case you are involving 
Trading of Assets, Consumption of Assets, um, Capital Market Transactions, Cross-Border Payments and so on. All these things, you know, which are very high volume transactions and or high frequency transactions, they benefit very strongly from a uh, digital dollar, digital euro and so on. So imagine you can now transfer 100 US dollar from here to South Korea and the money arrives with, within a couple of milliseconds. You know, this is the, the image you could, you should have. And now typically you would ask, yeah, well, come on, uh, what's, what's the benefit here? You can also do this with PayPal. Yes, you can do this with PayPal, but PayPal needs to include your country. Therefore, in case PayPal is not existing in, in your country, say a distant remote country in Africa or South America and so on, in case this country is not covering PayPal, then once again, you have all the, uh, all the, the tiring things with low transactions and high transaction costs over there, right? So PayPal needs to operate in your country. Plus, PayPal is not for free. PayPal has fees. For example, merchants typically pay one or two or something like this percent of the transaction value in terms of fees. So PayPal is not by far not as efficient as blockchain transaction systems could be. So you see here cross-border payments around the globe are very, very important um, and uh, are one driver why the digital dollar, the digital euro and so on makes sense. Right now we may add because I just had an idea and basically I was just looking it up as you spoke. Uh, for example, the little country in Bhutan in the Himalayas between India and China, they don't have PayPal. So basically you would need to go back to SWIFT, which is basically a messaging system between banks. And basically the message says, okay, in a few days, uh, 2,000 euros from this person will arrive in most banks. They'll wait until the money arrived and then pay it out to you. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly the point, you know, and that, that's, that's also repeating what I have said, you know, in case you are a normal citizen in a normal German town and doing normal transactions, then the world is fine for you. But as soon as you are doing international cross-border stuff and uh, also involving emerging uh, economies and so on, then the current uh, infrastructure is inefficient. And now you would say, yeah, but why should you care, right? I think I think we should care because it's hundreds of millions of citizens on earth which are basically suffering from inefficient infrastructures because this is basically how they have been built in the last decades, right? So therefore, here we see very nicely digital dollar and all this stuff uh, can really benefit uh, people over there. For example, take El Salvador, right? El Salvador is not having an own currency anymore. They have the US dollar and now the Bitcoin. So in case, um, so so with this, with the US dollar, with the digital US dollar, you could also easily transfer money in and out of El Salvador in denoted in US dollar forth and back very efficiently. This is, I think, one of the very key uh, aspects here. Another key argument uh, why we should talk about digital dollar, why it does make sense, is the following, um, because, um, which is a little bit difficult to explain, right? Because imagine you are purchasing a stock of General Electric, for example, right? So you, you have the payment infrastructure in case I'm purchasing shares, then 1,000 euro are going out of my bank account. And for those persons who are selling this, this share to me, they are getting my money. So I'm sending money from me to another person. And on the other hand side, I get shares from another person to me. So this is basically what trading makes sense. It's basically ownership changes, right? Mm -hmm. But from an IT perspective, these are two different IT systems. Because it's siloed, right? There is the silo of money transferrals. That's basically where money is, is being moved forth and back. And there is the silo of securities where shares are being moved forth and back. And these two silos, they are not perfectly nicely connected. So it's difficult to reconcile all these uh, transactions. That's why you need to have clearing houses. So in finance, you have clearing houses. They are connected to, to multiple such silos and then they help facilitate this kind of trade because they need to reconcile these multiple silos and the transactions which are happening in these silos, right? So, and in case you are now deploying the US dollar or the, the euro on a blockchain system, then the world changes dramatically. And the key point is here that you have one blockchain infrastructure, one infrastructure, and on this one and the same infrastructure, you have the euro, the dollar, the general electric uh, stock, the Apple stock, the Google stock, and so on and so forth. So we have one joint infrastructure and 
many currencies, many shares, many stocks, many securities running on one and the same infrastructure. And in case trading takes place now, then the settlement of this trading will simply be executed by smart contracts. This would mean the technology is simply doing in a very secure way this kind of trade. And this then results in the very severe consequence that we can get rid of clearing houses. So you remove clearing houses, you remove their cost structure, you remove their counterparty risk, you remove their uh, the, the cycle time they need to process the transactions on and so on. The business model of a clearing house just doesn't make sense anymore in a blockchain world, right? And this then allows you to trade more efficiently uh, w with uh, with less time, lower costs, and also allows you to transfer securities more easy uh, on a cross-border way and so on and so forth, right? And therefore, as in Germany, we typically call these discussions delivery versus payment. So I deliver shares versus I get payment from the other side, DVP. That's big. I don't know how this is called in, in other countries, but in here you know, we call it DVP. And um, this very uh, this shows very nicely where the, where the real benefit of uh, digital currencies are lying in case you are doing such capital market transactions. And then one, one, one more sentence show, if I may. So this is also applicable to products and services in the future, right? So yes, I now explained capital market transactions, purchasing, selling shares, yes. But you could also easily do this with basically consumer purchases, uh, all kinds of services being offered to, to retail people and so on, because the, the service is running on chain, the money is running on chain, and the smart contract is facilitating the trade such that you do, do not have to have these, uh, these, these clearing houses. And then you end up with much more efficient business processes within companies, right? Much more uh, efficient business processes within com countries. You know, this is the the easy explanation, and we could go on for hours now to basically dig into this. It's getting very complex, but in my personal opinion, these are the two main reasons why it does make sense. So, uh, bottom line is a lot of businesses will get cheaper buying and selling of products, especially internationally. Also including uh, financial assets here. Um, plus, there will be business models that go out of business, not like this, but maybe 20, 50 years down the road, depending on the regulation, like in terms of clearing houses. I was also wondering, actually, you, the money transfer fees will go down, which will be another blow to the banks because they actually making money out of this. And also uh, foreign currency trading, I do believe, may also go down a lot. Is, is there still a sense of foreign currency trading? Because right now, when you are like a really big guy, say, for example, uh, Deutsche Telekom, and you need to send money over to uh, T-Mobile US, you basically tell your bank, okay, I need 200 million US dollars sent over there. So first, they exchange euro for US dollars and then they send it over. And this transaction, this exchange is actually taking place on FX markets. Is there still a business for them or will it be completely automated? Hopefully on blockchains in Europe and uh, the United States that talk to each other that are compatible. The, the key reason is the following. In, uh, at this point of time, we talk about the ECB, ED, um, uh, the, the central bank digital currency, CBDCs, right? At this point of time, people very often think that the digital euro will run inside, in, in some kind of mono, yeah, in some kind of silo system, right? You operate basically the, the CBDC as a euro, but actually I don't think that this will be the, the future. I would rather think that we will have all kinds of blockchain infrastructures, you know, that's a technical infrastructure. And then you're deploying the euro on top of it. You can deploy the euro, the euro on Ethereum. You can deploy the euro on Tron or on Binance Smart Chain or on any other crazy infrastructure, right? So we will have multiple euros. They are all called the euros, but they are multiple euros running technically on different infrastructure. And the same is already true now for the US dollar. So This trading, which you just mentioned, will take place because the euro is sitting or the US dollar is sitting on multiple infrastructures at the same point of time. And uh, of course, you know, all these, uh, all these, um, these, uh, these, these tokens then need to be balanced. And I would like to point to some other thing, right? Imagine the following. We have a quite strongly exporting industry in, in Germany, you know, like 
companies doing amazing machines and they are selling this machine to the entire world. Now imagine a machinery company in Germany selling a machine to China. China is needs to pay for this and China is developing its digital currency solution, right? So that the, so the Chinese customer might demand from the German machinery companies to onboard to the Chinese payment system because the, the Chinese customer tells to the machinery company in Germany that the German company is only getting the money via the Chinese payment infrastructure. And this way you will, by this, by this networking thought, right? You automatically get some adoption, not just in China, but also with your trade partners who are doing import and export business all over the world, right? And with this, uh, com countries like China, US and other ones, they can basically try to get other parties into their system because basically this is this is the nature of import and export, right? And therefore, we will also have some kind of demand from companies who want to have the digital dollar because they then know that they can design their business processes in a more efficient way. So so, so imagine your Siemens, right? In case Siemens wants to create more efficient business processes, they somehow have to embed the digital euro, dollar, whatever. And in case the euro has not become digital at this point of time because it's not running on a blockchain system or whatever, what, what, is, he, what is Siemens doing then? You know, they are not waiting until the ECB has finished, right? They are simply connecting to the US dollar or to, or to some other uh, currency, right? And this is exactly why the, the digitization of such currencies, you know, the topic we are talking about is in my mind very important. It has a geopolitical uh, aspect and it's a, it's a, it's, um, uh, there are some competitive pressures going on, right? Countries and their currencies, they have to think about digitization at some point of time. If they don't, then the companies, they are simply turning away and doing their money transactions with other currencies, right? Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Um, basically, when you've been talking about this, I was, uh, I was putting myself in the shoes of financial regulators like central banks or um, oversight bodies who have to guarantee that um, the system is stable. And then you are a US employee sitting somewhere in New York, in Chicago, in Dallas, wherever the, the feds are. And um, actually, you then have to make sure all the digital US dollars are regulated and they are stable. That would actually give me a really, really big headache. Also for the European Central Bank, when, um, when you have to make sure you have to oversee certain entities and they're actually under the jurisdiction of the US because they're, they are uh, working with the US dollars, but they are also licensed in the, in Europe. So you also have to oversee them. So that is a big mess. And I do understand why they are moving slowly. Everybody has to sort this out because otherwise there will be an entrepreneur at the end regulated by five different bodies. And they all say left, right, front, back, up, down. All at the same time. Yeah, but, but you know, this is this is the example of PayPal, right? PayPal is a company being regulated in Europe, uh, in the US, and in, in many countries. And uh, I think the, the 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 game which will go on will will be the following: um, the government or the regulator is saying you're welcome to start your own stable coin, but you can only use it as the dollar in case you're applying to the regulatory requirements. Then you get a license. And in case you are misbehaving, in case you're doing bad things, money laundry, in case you are not backing up the, 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 the stable coin with uh, the required amount of US dollar, in case you're misbehaving, then we're taking away the license from you. And then you have to stop operating, right? The, and, and this way, this way, I think you can assure that also many companies at the same point of time are behaving adequately. The same is already happening now for PayPal, right? I trust PayPal because it, it works in case I send money via PayPal. It really arrives, right? So I'm really trusting them. And the, the, the root of this trust is basically the licenses PayPal is having in multiple countries. Yeah. For example, in Europe, they are licensed in Luxembourg as far as I know. Um, I also have, um, one topic. I uh, would like to touch here, especially KYC taxes and regulations that will also be like very long down the road, but basically that all has to be accounted for as well. And when you have a digital euro that can change like this, I do believe um, the KYC uh, 
anti money laundry uh like you you want to avoid that illegal money from drugs or uh or weapons deals comes into the system again uh prostitution um whatever comes back that the money's all taxed and all of them have to be a little bit regulated so that also needs to be thrown into the digital euro um but basically i would say at one point down the road basically you need your app and your cell phone and hopefully you don't lose it yeah no this is absolutely true uh, uh, nicely explained right but i think you know you have two very diverging views here you know the the government and the regulator would love to identify any endpoint of any transaction for any cent being sent to other people right you know any millicent being sent around the world they would like to identify to really check whether this this is good money or bad money right mm -hmm. and the customer on the other hand side you know this can also be african countries or people in el salvador and somewhere on earth what would they like to have exactly the opposite they would like to be not identified at all right because this is because then they can freely transact you know uh, with, with all kinds of um, possibilities and they do not have to to take the burden of identifying themselves and i think therefore you know we have to accept uh, how this basic how this two possibilities are and therefore i think to be honest the us dollar stable coins they try in the future to do a good balance between these two worlds and this balance could look like follows you are allowing anonymous transactions for low amounts of money say 100 us dollar and below yeah uh, you do not need to present your identification of your passport uh, in case you are transferring less than 100 us dollar you know this is a like a vicious number you know i just said now 100 us dollar but it could make sense and as soon as you're transacting more than 100 us dollar or more than 1000 us dollar then both transaction parties have to present their id card to some kind of uh, entity because then they first need to get authorized to do such a large scale uh, transactions and depending on the size and on the amount of the money being transferred kyc requirements are getting fiercer and fiercer and the lower the amount is the um, the more um, softer you can make these potential requirements for the transactions i think such such uh, such an architecture would make sense because then you would basically comply with the needs of the people to easily transact money low amounts of money and in case uh, the the government wants to analyze huge amounts of money being moved around then of course the government might has the right and it's it's basically good this way to require uh, identity card and identity management and all kinds of things for the transactions to be approved yeah does it make sense yeah that makes sense and actually there there are two points when you've been talking about that and one final question that i have one point was basically when you have a wallet on the phone now in germany you can have your id card not the travel passport but the national id card bundespersonalausweis on your app as well so basically you just would need to connect both and ta-da identification um and secondly i was uh I, i like to do a little bit sarcastic and humorous um humorous ideas because humor got, gets to places where rationality never reaches uh basically what you said i would translate if you send a few euros totally fine you can send it to anonymous uh email addresses if you are sending more than uh 10 million US dollars, which in international capital markets is a low number and it occurs every day. Basically best you take your, your ID card, your travel passport and walk directly into the office of, of the regulator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this, these thoughts in my mind uh, make very much sense. And now let's come back to the European Central Bank, right? The way they are designing their digital euro on behalf of the ECB, they are at this point of time disregarding these um, international um, money flows outside the euro region. So they, they don't really care about the euro flowing from an African country to a South American country. So this is basically not on their focus. So they are disregarding this kind of international aspect, which we now really discussed a lot and also found that it is important. And, um, and they also would at this point of time, at least demand identification of the endpoints of transactions, right? So 
you have two points here in my mind where the US dollar stable coins are better than what is being planned by the ECB. And that's exactly why I said that there is a gap between the Fed and the ECB on the one hand side and China on the other hand side. And the US dollar has the potential to fill this gap with the, with the US dollar stable coins. Yeah. Because they are basically, they, they very nicely fit into this gap. Um, as we discussed it now for half an hour, but for Europe, we don't have a stable coin, which fills this gap. And we also don't have an ECB, which is thinking of a solution, which is, which potentially fills this gap. Right. And this is what me currently, uh, let me thinks, um, that I could imagine that the that the European currency, the euro, is basically decreasing in importance because they are they are simply not uh, capable of meeting the demands of a digitized world, um, as we have said. You know, international transferals, money on blockchain systems, and all kinds of things. And then um, also with this international aspect, people might find the euro not adequately be digitized uh, to make it useful. Plus the disincentive for private entrepreneurs we discussed with the negative interest rates. At this point of time, you know, in case the interest rates are rising, then uh, suddenly this business model would make, would make sense. Mm -hmm. And one final question, because we are now recording for over 45 minutes, um, but I really enjoyed this. We should do this more often. Um, final, final question would be, we always talked about the infrastructure. Um, Who do you think will run this infrastructure talking explicitly here about the digital euro? I know in the US, the digital US dollar, the stable coins, they're already there. They're private and the US dollar is regulated by the Fed. Okay, that's fine. And in Europe, where there is no like really big alternative to, um, to, uh, to central bank money, like a few stable coins, who will run here? the uh, infrastructure. Exactly. So stable coins are being made to, to run on existing blockchain infrastructures uh, such as Ethereum, Tron, Cosmos, Terra and all kinds of smart contract platforms for coming from the crypto world. You know, this is basically where stable coins are running. And we already see in the US dollar world that this works very nicely. We have a daily transaction volume of up to 100 billion day by day at this point of time. Um, The ECB most probably, you know, as far as we know today, plans an infrastructure, which is basically proprietarily being developed by them, which is not open, which is then basically uh, under full control of the ECB. And if I, also if I would, if somebody would ask me what I would suggest to the ECB, then I would suggest to them that they should also think of deploying the euro on smart contract platforms exactly in the similar way like the US dollar stable coins have been created. If I were a central bank, I would, I would uh, urgently think of creating central bank issued stable coins, like a hybrid between the stable coins we know today, but not filled by company monies like Tether and Circle, but rather being filled by the central bank, you know, why not? And I think this could be a very interesting thought, you know, in case central bankers are now listening, Joe, they would shake their heads and say, so what a catastrophe, you know, what a bad, what a bad podcast, you know, this is what they would say now. But to be honest, I could imagine that in the, in the future, um, this, this could be a very interesting alternative uh, to think about because it could potentially be the best of both worlds, right? Amazing closing words. Philip, as always, it was a pleasure having you a guest. Hope to have you back, let's say, latest end of the year, maybe next year. And then we can talk maybe a little about the progress in digital euro or even stable coins. Thank you very much and have a great day. Yeah, thank you. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.